Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 76, which reads as follows. Nidhi nang wa pavattarang yang pase vajja dasinang nigai ha vading medha wing Tadi sang panditang baje. Tadi sang bhajamana sa seyo hoti na papio ti. Which reads as which translates to one who, like one who unearths or yeah, uncovers buried treasure. Whatever person seeing one's faults, passe when seeing one's faults, vajjadasina, uh, lets them be known, lets one know one's faults, lets one know of one's own faults, so points out one's faults. Uh, someone who, niga, uh, this person, nigai uh, hawading, one who speaks in uh, censure or, or gives one admonishment, admonishes one. Medha wing, a wise, should be considered a wise person. Tadi sang banditang pati, such a person, person should be associated with by the wise. If, if a person is wise, such a person uh, is to be associated with by the wise, by wise people. When one associates with such a person, things get better, not worse. Seyo hotina papio, they get better. You don't go to evil. They don't get worse. So associate with people who point out your faults. When you do, things get better, not worse. This verse was told in regards to a, a student of Sariputta named Radha. Radha was a poor Brahmin who listened, heard the Buddha's teaching and went to live with the monks, but the monks were unwilling to give him the higher ordinate, to give him any ordination. I think somewhere there was a comment that it was because uh, he, he took such great care of the monks and they were reluctant to give him the ordination because they needed someone to look after them. Which is sort of an interesting situation. I'm not, it doesn't say that in this version of the story. But for some reason it may have been that he was old. Uh, it may have been that they had no trust in him. But the Buddha saw this and the Buddha uh, discerned through his uh, vast knowledge and understanding that Radha would actually be capable of becoming an arahat if he were to ordain. So he went to the monks and he said, "Why is the, who is this man? Kind of pretending that he didn't know or not letting on that he didn't know, that he knew. And they told him who he was. They said, well, why isn't he, or why aren't you ordaining him? I think maybe that's where it says. It may actually say why they didn't ordain him. But anyway, so he said, hey, does anyone, do any of you, can any of you think of a reason why you, why you might be inclined to ordain him? Can any of you remember something that he did for you? And Sariputta piped up and said, I remember once when he was living at home, he gave me a spoonful of rice. And the Buddha said, well, Sariputta, uh, don't you think it's appropriate to be grateful and to repay people's, people's kindness? Which is interesting because he didn't do that great of a thing in, in the grand scheme of things. All he did was give him a single spoonful of rice. But it's a testament to the Buddha's sensitivity and Sariputta's gratitude uh, in remembering, you know. So when, when, when you ask someone, 
did they do something, have, has this person done anything for you? And it's, it's not common for people to think, to, to keep that in their mind, that this person did such a simple thing to them. But Sariputta was a person who uh, had this great uh, sensitivity, you know, he, he, he really, he, he didn't take for granted the fact that he had been given even a single uh, spoonful of rice, and so he spoke up and the Buddha said, well, in that case, don't you think it's worth ordaining him? And Sariputta immediately said, in that case, I, I will ordain him. And so Sariputta gave him the ordination, and I guess there was some skepticism as to whether this monk would actually, whether this man would actually make a good monk. Uh, but Sariputta was uh, fair with him and honest with him, and, and found that actually Radha was quite amenable to training. So Sariputta would tell him, don't do this, don't do that, and he would take everything Sariputta said to heart, when Sariputta told him, you have to do this, you have to do that. He would, he would only have to hear it once, and he would immediately yeah, adjust himself. And when Sariputta admonished him, saying, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, this is not right, you have this fault, you have that fault, he was completely amenable. And so the Buddha asked him at one time, you know, how is your student going? Do you find him amenable? Sorry, Buddha said he is, he is the perfect student. He, he, um, when I tell him not to do something, he stops doing it and never have to tell him twice. And the same goes with telling him what, to, what he should do. He is the perfect student. I, and and uh, the Buddha said, if you could have other students like him, would you, would you ordain? Uh, people, the others, if you knew that they were going to be like him, and he said, if I could have a thousand students, I would gladly take them on if they were all like Radha. And the monks got talking about this, and they said how, how amazing it was, how wonderful it was that Sariputta had found such a wonderful student, and that Radha also had found such a wonderful teacher who was willing to point out his faults. And in no long time, Radha became an arahat, as predicted. And the Buddha heard about heard the monks give, talking like this, and then he, as a result, spoke this verse, saying, "Indeed, uh, Radha is very lucky. Yeah, Sariputta is very lucky, but Radha also is very lucky because Sariputta is someone who is like." a person who points out buried treasure. And he spoke this verse. So that's the back story. It's a fairly well-known Buddhist story among Buddhists. And it relates to our practice in regards to the role of a teacher and one's relationship with one's teacher. You could also say it, it relates to our own ability to receive uh, criticism in general, and therefore to our, our, life, our, our relationship with anyone who gives us criticism, because we receive criticism from all sorts of sources, from many people who are not cap qualified to criticize. You know? How do you deal with people who criticize you unjustly, for example? This doesn't directly relate to that, but that's the general uh, t subject that we're dealing with. A and it's interest it, it, it relates because this is so contrary to the, or the state of an ordinary human being, which is to um, incline towards hiding one's faults and becoming upset when people point out our faults from criticizing people for being critical. You know? Everyone's a critic, we say. And to some, there, there, there's a, there are teachings that, in, that uh, instruct students, teachers will sometimes instruct students, or there's books that are written that say you should accept criticism and, and thank anyone who gives you criticism. And I think there's some truth to that. Uh, but the, the response and the Skepticism is that it leads you, leads you to allow others to walk all over you, you know, and to give unjust criticism and to leave unjust criticism unchallenged. And I think that, that also is a good point, and it goes against the Buddhist teaching, 
in in the monastic society, uh, there's a a monk should be um, criticized, not, not criticized, but a monk is wrong. Uh, is 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 at fault when they um, get angry at criticism, you know, so respond angrily or um, criticize in return. So you tell me I did this wrong, and I say, well, you did this other thing wrong. Or to uh, ignore people's criticism and not accept their criticism. All of this is faulty. But what's also faulty is to uh, not speak in one's defense. One is at fault when one doesn't speak in one's defense. So that's um, so. Th there, there's a sense of of having to be in, be mindful and to be wise and to be balanced in in many um, issues that we deal with in life. Buddhism doesn't have a be all end all answer. And Buddhism is much more dealing with the building blocks. And the, what is what are the things that make up any given situation? So there are much, much more general principles. And the general principle is to be able to discern the truth from falsehood and right from wrong. Yeah. But here we come to this uh, specific example of when the criticism is warranted. You know, so we're, we're dealing with someone who actually points out true faults. As I think it, it, it can be said that there's a, quite often a grain of truth in every criticism. You know, there's, there's a reason why we're being criticized. Often people will criticize us unwarranted, or look, not, not wishing to help us. So people criticize us often uh, looking to upset us or looking to humiliate us or looking to, uh, to hide, their, hide our own faults. You know, we criticize others to hide our own faults, this kind of thing. But even still, even in those cases, it's much easier to see the faults of others. And uh, we hide our own faults, but we're very good at picking out the faults of others. Uh, but here, in the case of a teacher, we have another dilemma, and that's our inability to accept reasonable, and, and our inability to, to accept uh, criticism, not because it's not um, correct, but uh, because it's, uh, it's an, it shows a fault. You know, it, it, it hurts our ego. You know, it, it, it attacks something that we are protecting, and that is ourself. You know, we hold ourselves dear. We uh, cling to an image of who we are or who we want to be. And when that image is threatened, like anything, any belonging, anything we hold dear, we react, we get upset. And so this teaching is um, actually quite important for uh, meditators in a meditative setting because we need to take advice from others unless you're the kind of person who can um, become enlightened miraculously by oneself. We have to take advice from others. And as a teacher, this is something that is quite familiar. Um, it often, uh, it, it, it becomes so uh, difficult that teachers are often afraid to give advice. And, and much of a teacher's role and duty is to find ways to admonish one's students without upsetting them. Now, part of the a great part of the skill of being a good teacher is the ability to not upset one's students because anyone can give advice and a, a real sign unfortunately of, of, a, of a poor teacher is not being able to it's not that they can't give advice but not being able to couch the advice in such uh, delicate um, you know, uh, terms or, or, or means that the student is actually able to accept it. So you'll often hear people giving advice, and you, as a teacher anyway, you cringe because you know that's not going to work and you're just making the student upset. What you're saying is correct, but it's not going to get through. And that's unfortunate because 
um, it often makes it, it, it makes the teacher's job more difficult and it hampers the teacher's ability to be frank with the student. And often a teacher's, a teacher's duty is, uh, requires upsetting the student and sometimes you have no choice. Your, your choice is to not teach them or to hurt them, to upset them. And you have to gauge how far you can push a, a student which is unfortunately usually not very far. Usually, unless you're dealing with a special person like Radha, which is why Sariputta was so happy, but for most people, we're very un it's very difficult for us to take criticism, very hard for us to uh, prevent the, the anger and the, the self-righteousness when people try to, you know, even well-meaning, try to help us. And so, we have to be aware of this, and that's one of the important aspects of this teaching that I think a lot of people react favorably to when this imagery of pointing out buried treasure. So we try to remind ourselves of this and, and to think of it as someone pointing out buried treasure. And that's why we'll uh, come up with these teachings where we tell people, you know, anyone who criticizes you, you should thank them. You should thank people who criticize you. I don't think um, I, I don't think it's as I said that you, when when a criticism is faulty, I don't think you should be hesitant to point out when it's faulty. Like my teacher said, when, if someone calls you a buffalo, you just turn around and feel if you have a tail. If you don't have a tail, you should tell them, "I don't have a tail. I'm not a buffalo." I, he didn't quite say it like that. In fact, it's more annoying for yourself. And, and I think that, and that, that's the key that I, you, we should point out is it requires wisdom. You have to be wise and, and, and know, you know, is this person, or what is their motive for doing this, first of all, but regardless of their motive, is there truth behind what they're saying? We, criticism is a very big part of the teaching dynamic. As, as mentioned, but also a very big part of our practice because, of course, it's dealing with ego. It's a good test of our uh, state of mind and our purity of mind, how well we're able to take criticism. So criticism is actually a useful tool in our practice when to, to put ourselves in position or to allow others to criticize us and to be mindful and to meditate on the criticism, on our reactions to the criticism, you know, seeing how our mind reacts. Uh, an enlightened being is the same in both praise and blame. When people praise them, it's as though they didn't even hear it. They don't have any pleasure, they don't take pleasure when others, they aren't excited when other people praise them. Uh, but it's the same when, when others have um, insulted them or criticized them. It's also as though they didn't hear. In, in a sense, they take it for what it is. They take it at face value. This person just said, I'm doing something wrong. And so, okay. Well, they look at it and, right, I was doing that thing wrong, and so they change it. Or this person's upset at me and uh, they want me to do this or they want me to stop doing that. Okay, well, I'll stop doing it because that would upset them, you know, to a, to a certain extent, but they do everything mindfully and, and with wisdom, knowing what is the right state. It's not that they're a pushover and someone tells them, you know, you're too fat, you should go on a diet. They don't really see the point of that. Why, you know, why would I concern myself with my weight? You're too skinny, you should eat more. Well, that's not why I eat, so... Uh, but they don't get upset, you see. The point is, they're unperturbed in both praise and blame, and we have to look at both because this is relating to the ego. It's relating to our um, conceit, you know, our self, our view of self. So it's a good indicator. And the other part of this quote is in regards to staying with such a person. The point, the specific point, that things get better. And that's a very useful advice to give oneself when one is angry, because you'll often get angry at your teacher. It's a common thing. I had one student recently um, who said, I'm very angry at you. Recently, I think that those are the words. I'm, I'm very angry at you. 
right now. Because I, I had the, I, it wasn't even criticism, it was asking them to do something that just seems utter, seemed utterly ridiculous to them, seemed, seemed totally above and beyond what they were capable of. And I said, well, well I didn't, uh, what was it, I, I didn't, uh, this wasn't my idea, I wasn't the one who created this teaching. And they said, well, I'm very angry. They were very angry about it. Um, and this is, this is quite common. It's quite common for meditators to get angry at their teacher. And, and so there's no, there's no uh, shame in that, and there's no reason to get upset. It's why we ask forgiveness when we do a meditation course. We often formally ask forgiveness of the teacher, and the teacher asks forgiveness of the student both when we start the course and when we finish the course, to so sort of clear the air. But the point is, this, this verse is quite useful. It's been useful for me to remind myself um, that no matter how difficult things get, staying with a teacher and at a meditation center, we have to remember that we want to do that which makes, us, which, um, makes things better, makes it better makes us better people, improves our situation, makes us happier. We have to remember that we know this. We know that staying in the meditation center with a teacher is going to make things better. We often make excuses. I'm not ready, or um, you know, the, the, the environment's not right, I'm not at the right point in my life. We have to remember that this is all excuses, that uh, it, the truth is Staying in a meditation center, with a meditation center, things will get better. And whatever excuses we have for not staying um, are, are invalid, because here is a person who is willing to help us with our faults. The faults are, are, are what we're focusing on. And people looking to criticize Buddhism will, will use this as a criticism, that Buddhism is very pessimistic, which is ridiculous, utterly ridiculous, harmful. It's a terrible, terrible criticism. Uh, made by, by, often by lazy people who, who aren't interested in looking at their faults. Because this is, it's very damaging to say that. The faults are the only reason for self-development. It is, it is our faults that we want to focus on. Not so that we can feel bad about ourselves or feel we're horrible people, but to actually fix something, to make something better. How do you make something better without looking at what's wrong? looking at the problem, and this is what we do. If you don't have someone who can show you your faults, who can point them out to you, can help you fix them, well, obviously it's not enough to point out one's faults, but to actually help you fix them, this is where things get better. This is where true uh, development and, and progress and, and goodness comes from. So, a very useful verse, something that we should remember. Someone who points out your faults when they see them, you should liken them to a person uh, who points out buried treasure. When you stay with, you should associate with such a person. The wise should associate with such a person. When such a person, when one associates with such a person, things get better, not worse. Seyo hoti na papio. That's the verse for today. And that's our teaching on the Dhammapada. Thank you for tuning in. Wishing you all the best.